Well, thank you so much, Alice Ann. Thank you, Warren, for being here and giving us an update and reminding us of how we can be involved in bridges. Thank you, Gene, for praying for us this morning. Thank you, Winnie. Um, you know, every week, Winnie says, well, what are the topics this week? Because she tries to make a song set that kind of goes along with them. And um, sometimes it's easier than others, I will admit. But uh, this week kind of hit it out of the park, as you'll see as we go through, because we are in the midst of a sermon series on the book of Revelation. And we're in that section of Revelation that probably most pastors are very comfortable covering. We aren't into the uncomfortable bits yet. But the seven letters to the seven churches are so practical and so you know, easy to understand and explain that you've probably heard sermons about them before. But unfortunately for you, that doesn't mean we're going to skip it. You're going to hear another sermon on another church from the book of Revelation. But as a reminder, John is on Patmos. He's been exiled for his faith. We think it's probably around you know, 90 A.D., um, you know, 60 years or so after Jesus Christ has been put to death, the, the Roman Empire is rife with persecution of Christians. Um, one of the things that is going on is emperor worship, where everyone is expected to do kind of like a Pledge of Allegiance. You go into a temple that is for the emperor, and you burn incense and basically say, I am loyal to the Roman Empire, but it was also an indication that Caesar is God. So you can see why Christians would have a little problem with that. Well, anyway, that is what is going on. And John is in exile, and he's writing the book of Revelation to the church as a whole, but to seven churches in particular. And we assume that what is happening is it goes to Ephesus, and then it's read there, and it goes to Smyrna, and it's read there, and on and on and on, until all seven churches have received the entire message, which means that each church is hearing what's going on with the other churches. And although there is information for them in particular, they realize that everything to all seven churches and everything in the entire book applies to all of them. So we understand that it applies to all of us as well. We looked at Ephesus last week. This week we're looking at Smyrna, which is actually the city of Izmir. And here's a picture of that city. And what, what is interesting that we don't always get in America is that there is a real sense of history in many cities around the world that you don't always get in America. Now, sometimes you can go to a, like a revolutionary fort, right? And you understand that, oh, a couple hundred years ago, something significant might have happened here. Well, if you look at the picture of Izmir here, there you go. In the middle, you see that white building? That's a parking garage. But now let's take a close-up. Roman ruins, right there. Right there. That's what happens when you go to many places. In, uh, in the Middle East, in Asia Minor, you have the ruins right alongside modern construction. And what that does is it reminds us of the historicity of the churches. It reminds us of the truthfulness of God's Word you know, this isn't the Book of Mormon where things are made up and place names that have never been are mentioned. This is real stuff. And it reminds us of the importance of the message for then, but for us here and now as well. And the, the church at Smyrna is one of the churches where God doesn't have anything negative to say about it. But there is a reminder here. The reminder is you have been faithful continue to be faithful. And in looking at Revelation 2, 8 through 11, we learn something about faithfulness in ministry. Here's our passage of scripture. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, and we thank you so much for what you have revealed to us through your word that you are real, that you are here, that you are intervening in history, that, that even though we might not always see you working, you are working even behind the scenes, and you are bringing everything to a glorious conclusion. 
And we, we look forward to the coming of your kingdom and the, and the coming of Jesus Christ to this earth again. Until then, Lord, I pray that we will understand that the message of Revelation in some ways is really summed up by the church in Smyrna. We need to be faithful. Even in the midst of persecution and distress and trouble and, and tribulation and toils and despair, we need to be faithful because you are with us. You have given us everything. We are not poor, but we are rich. Help us to understand that today, Lord. And, and Lord, I pray if there's anyone here struggling in their relationship with you or struggling to know you, that through the power of your word and the power of your spirit, you will reveal yourself to them in a special way, even as we pray you will reveal yourself to all of us so that we will understand you better as a result of being here. And it's in Jesus Christ's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Well, first of all, we see Jesus revealed as Savior and God here. And in each one of these churches, we get a reminder of the vision that happened in Revelation 1, where we see Jesus as magnificent and holy and wonderful and awesome and as Savior and God. And that is what we see here. First of all, He is the first and the last. And this is a description of God the Father in the Old Testament, Isaiah 44, 6 and Isaiah 48, 12, as well as a reminder that this is Jesus Christ from Revelation 1. So he is indeed God, not just man, but God. And there is an additional reminder here that makes it important for the city of Smyrna itself. Because by calling Jesus the first and the last, they're also reminding the city that he is Lord over them, even though they think they are important. Because Smyrna was often called first in Asia in beauty and size. So there's a play on words here. You think you're first, Jesus Christ is first. And Smyrna also had something called the Golden Street. If you were sitting in the harbor and looking into the city, as this picture shows, there is a hillside. Back in Roman times, at the top of that hill would have been temple after temple after temple, and there would have been a street that connected them. And it was said to look like the, the head of a goddess with the street being her necklace. This is the kind of image people had of the city. And the reminder that Jesus Christ is the first and the last is that you think you're powerful. You think you're mighty. You worship these gods and goddesses. Well, in fact, there is only one true God, and you need to worship him. Jesus Christ is God, but he's also Savior. He was dead. He who was dead and came to life. He is the one that we look to for our salvation. He died on the cross for our sins. He died so that we could be forgiven. He died so that we could know God. He died so that we could be eternally with Him. And we're going to talk more about this in, in a little bit when we talk about how we are rich spiritually. But this is the reminder that not only is Jesus Christ God, He is Savior. There is no salvation but through Him. You look up at this top of the, the hill and you think, oh, this is magnificent, isn't this wonderful? And it's all fake, it's all false. It's really only about Jesus Christ. And once again, we have kind of a little hint to the history of the city here. Because it was captured and, only, and co almost completely destroyed in 600 B.C., and it was in partial ruins for 400 years. So in choosing these parts of the vision John had of Jesus Christ to reveal Jesus to the city. It's a reminder to them of their heritage, but also a reminder to them that Jesus Christ knows and understands who they are. He said, I know your works. He knows their works as a community. He knows their works as a city. He knows their works as a church. He is sovereign and He is Lord. There is nowhere they can go to get away from Him. There is nothing they can do that He doesn't know. He is God. Savior and God. And we see the faithfulness of the church in Smyrna. And this is where the I know is so amazing. In, in Ephesus, He had some problems with the church in Ephesus. Here He's saying, You're faithful. And it's awesome. I know 
what you have been putting up with. I know what you have been dealing with. The church is being pressed, is the literal Greek word there, pressed. And that's a great description of tribulation, of, of struggling, of, of being uh, assaulted from the outside. And it's probably a reference to the emperor cult. I mentioned this in the introduction. We'll talk about it in all of the, the seven letters to the seven churches. But basically, you were supposed to go to the temple that was for the, the emperor, and you were burn incense, showed you were a good citizen, showed you were believed he was God. Uh, whether you did or not, it at least showed it. And we have representatives of certificates that were given out, not specifically from this time period, but from later, that would say to those appointed to preside over the sacrifice, we have sacrificed and asked that you give us a certification, and then we, the representatives of the emperor, have seen you sacrificing. Okay, so this is your, this is your, this is your get out of Patmos free card. Okay? This is what John didn't have, apparently, because he wouldn't go and burn incense to the emperor. So the church is being pressed. You know, they're being told, you've got to do this. You've got to do this. And the church is experiencing economic hardship. Uh, not just poor, but literally penniless. You know, because if you were considered to be disloyal, well, then you might have trouble getting work, finding work. You know, so the church is experiencing economic hardship. And the church is being slandered. Slandered. And we have, through historical writing, some ideas of what these slanders were, what people were saying about the church. Um, some would say they were cannibals because they were taking the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Some would say they were uh, guilty of immorality because they called the Lord's Supper the love feast. And they, the people made up all kinds of ideas about what love feast really was. The, uh, those on the outside accused them of atheism because they didn't have images of their God. I mean, think about all these temples, right? You had statues and, and little icons and all kinds of things. Well, the Christians didn't have that. So, well, my goodness, they, they were atheists. Where were their gods? Um, they, they thought that they were home wreckers. Because the, the gospel caused conflict within people's homes and it caused difficulty in relationships. They thought they were treasonous because they wouldn't go to the temple and burn incense to the emperor. And they said they were incendiary. They, they believed in this end time apocalypse and the world was going to be destroyed by fire. And, and how could they believe that? So people were always saying, oh, Christians are guilty of horrible things. They want to raise up insurrections. They are immoral. They're destroying homes. They're cannibals. They're, they're atheists. And gosh, do any, does any of this sound familiar in our day and age? Not maybe exactly, but the slander that goes out there because people don't fully understand what we believe and they make assumptions about what we believe or why we believe it. And unfortunately, this was especially true of the Jewish neighbors, at least in Smyrna at this point in time. And that, that shouldn't surprise us because um, the Jewish religious leadership heavily persecuted the Christian church in, from the book of Acts forward. I mean, just taking some uh, examples from Acts, Acts 30, 50, but the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city, stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of the district. Acts 14, 2 and 5, but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. But the people of the city were divided, some with the Jews and some with the apostles, when an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and stone them. So we see definite persecution by the Jewish uh, people, our Jewish leadership. Acts 14, 19, but the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. And then Acts 17, 15, but the Jews were jealous and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. Now, I go through those examples from the book of Acts, and we could have more, just to explain some of the antagonism that seems to be represented here because the Jews 
are not Jews, but are a synagogue of Satan. Because of the slander, because of the animosity, because of the persecution. Of course, there's going to be some strong language here. And this also reminds us that there is more to Jewishness than physical descent. We, we see this in particular the writings of Paul in the New Testament. In Romans 2, 28-29, For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Galatians 3, 29, If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. The reminder is that there are Jewish people who are physically Jews, But spiritually, they aren't really Jews because they aren't truly following the Messiah. They are a synagogue of Satan, and they want to persecute the church. They especially want to persecute Gentiles who are believing in Jesus Christ as the Messiah because they saw the Messiah as Jewish. They they were so incensed that this could even happen. But the reminder here is that true circumcision is of the heart. And you can be, in a sense, a spiritual Jew, even if you aren't a physical one. The thing we have to remember in the midst of all of this is we look at the context, we understand what's going on historically, we understand spiritually what's going on as well, and we realize that although here that the Jews are called a, uh, the Jews who are Jews and are not, but are synagogue of Satan, even though they're being called out, we understand that these verses aren't an excuse for anti-Semitism. Because Paul, the one who was persecuted, Paul, the one who points out that they really aren't truly Jews spiritually because they they have not embraced spiritually the God of their fathers. They're just Jews physically. Paul is the one who says, For I wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. And then in Romans 10, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So the thought here is that the people, the church is being persecuted. There is some significant persecution coming from Jews who are Jews physically, Jews in lineage and descent, but not really Jews. Because if they were really Jews, they would follow God, they would believe in the Messiah, they would accept Jesus Christ. So here the reminder is that spiritually... Jews and Gentiles are united in Christ into one church. And in a sense, we are spiritual descendants of Abraham if we are willing to believe as well. And instead of saying here that, oh, these things, we we should be anti-Semitic because uh, Jews are really a synagogue of Satan. Well, you've missed the point completely. Although there have been people historically that have, have believed that, not only have you missed the point completely, the reminder here is truly that we are rich, and we are rich in part because of the spiritual heritage we have. Okay? We are rich, even though economically we may be poor. This is what we read in Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works that anyone should boast. This is the reminder here that we have been adopted, we have a spiritual standing, we have a spiritual home, We are gods through Jesus Christ. So it doesn't matter what happens to us in this world. And I said, well, gosh, you're you're going into this whole Jewish thing a lot. Well, I got to tell you that the synagogue of Satan thing has caused problems historically because people have misunderstood it. Okay, you know, but the, the true meaning for us today, the true reminder is that we are all spiritual descendants of the Jewish people, in a sense, if we believe in Jesus Christ as our Messiah. Because we are gods. We are adopted into his family. I mean, think about the gift that a person gives when they adopt someone into their family. We have been adopted by God. The Jewish people were his people. A large majority of them rejected him. That allowed 
us to become a part of the family as well. And we have a rich spiritual heritage through Christ. We were lost. We were excluded from the covenants and the promises. We did not know God, but God allowed us to come and be a part of his people. We had sinned. We had rebelled. We had done wrong in his sight. We deserve punishment. And Jesus Christ said, no, I'm leaving heaven. I'm coming to this earth. I'm dying on a cross and I'm dying on a cross for all people, not just the Jewish people. Anyone can be my child. Anyone can be a spiritual descendant of Abraham if they but believe. And when we believe, we are forgiven. We know grace. We know mercy. And this is the reason why even though the church in Smyrna, is being economically deprived, even though they are being pressed horribly, even though they are experiencing suffering, even though there are some so venomous and antagonistic toward them that they are being called a a synagogue of Satan, even in the midst of all of that, they are rich. And we are rich if we believe in this day and age too. In James 2.5 we read, Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? 2 Corinthians 6, 8 and 10, We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well, as, and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. And this understanding of our richness, our spiritual richness, our inheritance in Christ, our our being part of God's people, this should permeate our lives so much that when we do literally have more, unlike the church in Smyrna, many of us have more today, then we use it to actually do more. We're rich spiritually, and if we're rich physically, Materially, we're to use that richness to enrich other people spiritually too. 1 Timothy 6, 17, 19, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. And Jesus said this in Matthew 6, 19 and 20, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. So here's the thing. The church was being faithful. They were being pressed. They were being persecuted. They were, being, um, they were experiencing suffering and tribulation. And yet, in the midst of it all, they were faithful because they understood they were rich. It didn't matter the level of antagonism and the level of animosity. They understood that they were God's people now too. And they are rich. We are rich. If we believe we are rich, spiritually we have nothing to fear. Spiritually, we have a home in heaven. Spiritually, we have his Holy Spirit living inside of us. We are rich. So the church is faithful. The church understands. The church is doing what they're supposed to do. They're they're standing up in the midst of tribulation and trouble. And they are standing proud and they are standing firm. And they are reminded of the need for continued faithfulness. Because it's not going to quit. It's going to continue. Tribulation, trouble is going to continue. And we understand that that is part of life. We have been blessed in a lot of ways in this country that it hasn't been a great part of our lives overall, but we can see where it's getting worse and we understand from around the world that Christians are continually struggling and suffering because of their faith. Testing will come. He says you're going to be tested. Satan is going to test you. And we understand from Scripture that testing will come. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 2 Timothy 3.12 1 Peter 4.12 Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. When we do find ourselves 
persecuted for our faith, when we do find someone questioning us because of our Christianity, when we do find someone coming against us because we believe in Jesus Christ, it's not something strange. We want to act like it is. Not really. It's the way things are supposed to be. It's what Jesus said in his high priestly prayer. They hated me. You know what they're going to do? They're going to hate you too. We read this in Romans 8.18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Glory is coming, even though we experience suffering. And then Acts 14.22, Paul strengthened the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Suffering will come. Suffering is a part of Christian experience. We don't like it. We don't want it. In many ways, the church in America hasn't fully experienced it like so many around the world have, but it is coming. It will come. It is going to continue to be a part of our daily conversation, I think, from here on out. But it, what? Well, what does it mean when it says you're going to experience suffering for like 10 days? That's pretty specific, but we understand that oftentimes particularly in apocalypses and prophecies, numbers are used to represent other things. So does it mean it won't last forever? So it's, you're gonna be, you're, Satan's going to come, he's going to tr- persecute you, it's only going to last 10 days. It's going to be a little while, a little while, just a little while, 10 days. You can, you can, you've been faithful, you can continue to be faithful. This is a pep talk. You can do it, right? Or does it mean it will actually, 10 days, does it mean it will actually accomplish God's purpose? Because 10 in the Bible refers to like the Ten Commandments. It's the day the Passover lamb is selected. It's the day of atonement. It seems to signify completion. So 10 days could be complete suffering. Your suffering is going to be completed. And what does that mean? Does it end? Or does it mean that God is going to accomplish his purpose in your suffering? Because that is what happens in suffering. God has a purpose to accomplish in our lives. And that is why he allows it to happen to us. We read this in James 1, 2, and 3. Count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And the stead- let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. This is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and 10. But he said to me, this is when Paul was saying, I got this problem, God, take it from me, take it from me, take it from me. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. God has a purpose in our suffering. God is bringing a important conclusion in our lives as a result of our suffering. He is helping to make us more like Jesus Christ. So the reminder here, the reminder in all of these letters is we don't need to fear. Fear not. Fear not. And here are God's promises to the faithful. The faithful will hear and the faithful will conquer. That, that's the whole um, the word there is conquer or overcome, depending on the translation you have. The reminder to us, I think, and I mentioned back when we were talking about uh, the letter to the church to Ephesus, is that those who are gods, those who know him, those who have real, true faith, they will get it. They will understand. They will pay attention. They will listen. They will hear. They will overcome the world because this is the promise we have for 1 John 5, 4 through 5. And you might as well write it down on a 3 by 5 index card and memorize it because we're going to be going over it week after week after week because it's so important. For everyone who has born, been born of God overcomes the world or conquers the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? The overcomers are the ones who believe. The overcomers are the ones who know. The ones who know want to follow God, want to love God, want to serve God. We will hear. We will obey. The faithful will continue to be faithful as they are in Smyrna. And the faithful will be rewarded The faithful will receive a crown of life. The faithful will absolutely not be hurt by the second death. And this is another reason I say that 
it, the faithful, the overcomers, the conquerors, the ones who truly believe because they have everlasting life. We read this in James 1.12 about the crown of life. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God had promised to those who love him. And then from the book of Revelation itself, Revelation 20, 14 through 15, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So here's the thing. We all die physically. Everyone dies physically. But there is a spiritual death in a sense as well where you are isolated from God for eternity. You don't know peace. You don't know joy. You don't know love. People say, it, some, some want to say that's ceasing to exist. Some want to say you go to a place of everlasting punishment, a place of fire prepared for the devil and the angels, which I think is much more likely. But I don't like either one of those options. Do you really? No. No. So if you don't want to face spiritual death as well as physical, you need to believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. And the reminder for us here today is that, you know what? We have been given so much. I mean, even if, even if you take away anything in this life, to escape the lake of fire, the second death, to escape that, what would you give for that? So we should continue to be faithful. And we should want to be faithful if we know and if we believe. And as far as we can tell, the church in Smyrna was pretty faithful. Because when you go outside of the New Testament, the first well-attested Christian martyr is from the church in Smyrna. His name is Polycarp. He was the bishop. We think that he might have been converted under the ministry of the Apostle John. All of a sudden, the Roman authorities decided to come after him. And when he was arrested, he went willingly. He was charged to, um, charged to deny Jesus Christ, and he would be allowed to go free. And this was not done in isolation. This was done in the midst of a stadium event. Because what they were going to do is burn him at the stake. And when he was charged to reproach Christ, this is purportedly what he said. Eighty-six years I have served him, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my King and Savior? When they were getting ready to tie him down, to burn him at the stake, um, he said, you don't have to tie me down. I'll stand here. And he was burned for his faith. But we recognize in his willingness to do that that he was faithful to the very end to the God he served and the Savior he loved. Now, there is reportedly a prayer he said as he was burning. O Lord God Almighty, Father of thy beloved and blessed child Jesus Christ, through whom we have received full knowledge of thee, God of angels and powers and of all creation and of the whole family of the righteous who live before thee, I bless thee that thou hast granted unto me this day and hour that I may share among the number of martyrs in the cup of Christ for the resurrection to eternal life, both of soul and body, in the immortality of the Holy Spirit. And may I today be received among them before thee as a rich and acceptable sacrifice, as thou, the God without falsehood and of truth, has prepared beforehand and shown forth and fulfilled. For this reason I also praise thee for all things. I bless thee, I glorify thee, through the eternal and heavenly high priest, Jesus Christ, thy beloved child, to whom be glory with thee, with him and the Holy Spirit, both now and for the ages that are to come. Amen. And I think the only thing that we can say to that is, may God find us similarly, similarly faithful if we find ourselves experiencing the type of tribulation and persecution that so many around the world are experiencing today. Let's go to God in prayer. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you now and we thank you for all that you have done for us through Jesus Christ. And Lord, we just pray that you will help us to be faithful. Um, We sometimes forget how rich we are. We look at those around us who have material riches and we, we want to be more like them. And we forget that those, are, those material riches are some of the things that can so easily tear us away from you and, and being faithful to you and following you. Help us to remember that in the midst of our lives you have given us more than we even know or understand or imagine and help us to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And dear Heavenly Father, help us then to be faithful in serving you. And as a part of that service, um, standing up for you, living for you, following you, and, and sharing with others about you. And in the midst of struggles and suffering and toils, taking that opportunity to say, you know, it doesn't really matter what happens to us physically because we are secure spiritually. And to take that sure, true knowledge and to let others know that they can have that comfort, that assurance, that understanding. Help us, Lord, to stand up for you regardless of what we find ourselves facing in this life. And it's in Jesus Christ's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen.